Hello, my name is Robert Court. I work for HBK uh, and I'm a member of the fatigue group and I've been asked to step in at short notice, so apologies if I seem unprepared. Um, for those who don't know us, we have four groups. The durability and fatigue is, is the eldest, closely followed by the simulation test and measurement, who tend to be vehicles, ground vehicles. And the newer group is the sound, vibration and product perception, which used to be formerly known as not noise and vibration, but is now more, more about quality. Um, and those that operate across a range of industries and a range, range of age groups as well. But the one we're particularly proud, proud of of late is the Young Engineers Forum, where young engineers take on the task of organising events and seminars of, of interest to them. If you know young engineers who are early in their career and would like more advice, please, please get in contact. We're indebted to our corporate members, of which there are many, some are on page two. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to run the society. Events are run at cost wherever possible, and these are the people who back back the events in, in the broader sense, big conferences and things like the journal, which we publish twice a year. Each of the groups runs events. Sometimes they overlap with each other uh, on, on topics, and we share them. Um, I think I've got the numbers right. The, the, this week is the second of two on non-contact vibration measurement. Uh, today's is the second of six on reducing doubt in engineering measurement analysis, um, the first one of which was Damien Harty last week. And the next one for the young engineers is how to crash an efficient lightweight structure thousands of times and still survive. And that's coming up in December. So that's for this year. Uh, looking into next year, uh, we have net, vehicle, net zero vehicle engineering and design development technologies in April. Um, we have an exhibition at Silverstone, which is held in the Silverstone wing. That's where the, the pit lane is. Um, it's an exhibition supported by some, some presentations. I think there's four usually. And then planning further into the distance, the Fatigue 2024 com conference in Cambridge. So that's, that's that. I now ought to introduce our speaker. Okay, so Mars Dadson is today's speaker. He's a mechatronics engineer specializing in research and test instrumentation for over 25 years, encompassing not dissimilar to our own area of interest, but automotive, defense, and power gen. And when we were chatting a short while ago, he told me in the earlier days he worked for HBM, Jaguar Land Rover, and more recently, Alstom. He's now the technical manager at Proctor and Chester Measurements and manages the calibration laboratory and develops new measurement methods in response to customer requirements. And I think at that stage I will, should let Miles speak for himself because you've heard enough from me. Miles, okay. thank you. Thank you, thank you Robert. I'll uh, share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see the PowerPoint so yes, we, yes, we can. great i'll crack on um uncertainty of measurement within a force calibration laboratory um we have a force calibration laboratory at proctor and chester um and i'll be focusing on our um, facilities but there are many crossovers to other laboratory types so uh, just bear that in mind uh, as we're going through so first what is a measurement uh, it determines something about the property of an object, um, how heavy, long, hot, cold, fast, uh, many other uh, measurement units. Um, it is defined by an instrument that will give you a value and a unit for that measurement. However, there is always going to be some doubt with regard to that measurement, um, that doubt being uncertainty once it's quantified. It's not an error. Error is the difference between the measured value and whatever the true value is, and it's not accuracy. Accuracy is qualitative, um, uncertainty is quantitative. If you do a, a search on the web, uh, many different representations are available for what is error or what is uh, accuracy and precision, uh, and this is quite a, a common layout that you'll find. 
uh, various different scenarios. However, it is misleading because first of all, we have accuracy and accuracy is not necessarily defined. So if we replace accuracy with error, and we also have precision um, that should be replaced with uh, repeatability. So there are four different scenarios there. If we just take them top left, you would say is high in both categories, bottom right is low in both categories. And, and we'll come on to those in a little bit later. So first of all, if we change over from high accuracy, high precision to low error, high repeatability, that gives you a more understanding of the, the word or terminology that are used within calibration facilities. So if we now look at um, uncertainties uh, on those, there's always going to be a level of uncertainty associated with a measurement. So here um, on the right hand side, if we have a, a representation of a low uncertainty, uh, prescribed by the, the blue box or blue circle, sorry. Um, you can see now if we take the actual measured value away, there is going to be some level of grouping or not grouping. With most calibrations, you'll carry out more than one measurement. Here we have five, quite common to have three, sorry. And so if you put the mean, so you take the mean of all the different values, here we have top left will have a, a mean right in the middle of the target, but so will bottom left have a, a, a mean right in the, a bottom, uh, in the middle. On the bottom right, you have a very large scatter of results, very poor repeatability, uh, but you still have a mean that is very close to whatever the true value is. So if you use the same representation for uh, a facility that gives you a high uncertainty of measurement. The actual values don't change, but the uncertainty associated with those measurements does change. So here you can see the representation uh, of where the uncertainty of that measurement series lies. If you put the mean on, the mean sits within those. And when you compare a facility that gives you a low uncertainty of measurement and with a higher uncertainty of measurement, you can see straight away that the means don't change, but what will change is the uncertainty associated with those measurements that you've just taken. What causes the, uh, the uncertainty to, with regard to a measurement? It is all the reference equipment that you're using to establish that measurement value and depending on the different types of calibration facilities uh, and equipment, there could be just a few, and we'll come on to those very shortly, or there could be quite a lot. Also, the environment has a, a very large impact on uh, the, the measurements that you will take, which is why when you get into most calibration laboratories, it's a very tightly controlled environment. Then there's the methodology that is going to be used to calibrate. Um, you've got uh, various different standards available uh, and each will have their own little nuances about that, uh, the way that in which you conduct the, the calibration. Then there's the operator. Is the operator um, showing any bias, both um, conscious or unconscious? And is that operator allowed some level of scope into the calibration procedure? Is the calibration procedure prescriptive or does it leave a, a little bit to be uh, uh, to the user's inference? And then you've got the, the device under test as well, what um, foibles, what mechanical interfaces are uh, associated with the device that's being under test. And at the end of the day, when you had a, a calibration conducted, all you can really say is, on that day, under those conditions, by that methodology, the results were. It's a bit like an MOT for a car. The moment you drive the car off a, a forecourt from an MOT, the MOT is somewhat mute. So if we go into the device under test, this uh, operation of a device under test is totally independent of the laboratory's capabilities itself. So here we've put up two 
uh, examples. We have a, an analog force gauge on the left-hand side and a digital force gauge on the right-hand side. Uh, the analog, uh, you'll have, first of all, the best that you could probably achieve, depending on the size of the scale, is half a division. Plus, you've also got issues with parallax, what angle you're observing that at. And on the right-hand side with the digital display, you know, you've got a resolution of one, um, two decimal places. Um, realistically, that's uh, one part in 10,000. That's going some for a... Uh, and in, in industrial uh, instruments. So you've got those uh, issues associated with uncertainty as well, which is why some calibration certificates will give you an uncertainty of the laboratory's measurement system plus then a digit for the, uh, the device under test. When you've actually got all your uncertainties, wherever they've come from, be they uh, part of the methodology, the environment you're working with, the instrumentation you're using, you've got to combine them all together. Um, the most common way of doing this is carrying out a root sum of the squares. Um, this somewhat assumes that you've got a normal distribution and that all the uncertainties are independent of each other. They're not causal. One doesn't lead to the next. So uh, here I've got a, 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 an equation that or formula that shows uncertainty, root sum of the squares up to the nth uncertainty. So as an example, if you had all five terms at 0.2%, the uncertainty by this uh, method would be 0.45%, not just a straight linear addition of all of them, which would lead to 1%. And as with standard deviations, uh, with a confidence, uh, with coverage factor of K equals 2, that gives you two standard deviations on a normal distribution. Uh, normal uh, confidence of 95%. So as a, a worked example, here is one of our um, electromechanical calibration frames. It's a 10 kilonewton tension and compression frame. We have, first of all, the uncertainty budget of the machine. So this is actually physical assessment um, of both the method the operator, the environment, and the physical setup of a calibration. This will give you the root of some of the squares, uh, in this case, uh, just a smidge over 0.2%, uh, and comprises the standard uncertainty of the mean deflection, standard uncertainty of the calibration force, and the standard uncertainty due to resolution. So that gives you the physical aspect of conducting a calibration. And then you've got to add in all the instrumentation. So first of all, you have a reference load cell in there, in this case, just under 0.1%, a reference amplifier, 0.05%. Then to actually assess the, the input force that you're using, you have a response load cell, 0.068%, and its associated amplifier, 0.1%. Temperature effects across a calibration, which within our calibration lab is of the order of one degree. You know, and outside of that, then you have to uh, have greater control of the of the lab. And the last one is drift. It's a bit of a, um, an, uh, should we say, an afterthought add-in. It's more of a, an insurance um, for the uh, the calibration. And if you combine all of these as the root of the sum of the squares, they all are, the actual uncertainty of the final calibration of that frame is just under 0.3%. So within our accreditation, that's actually listed at 0.3% because going to three decimal resolutions like that is somewhat meaningless. There are several levels of calibration. The uh, first one, or the top level, is a primary force calibration where you actually use dead weights. Uh, and the kind of facilities that will operate these are um, physical, National Physical Laboratory has several, um, and their compatriots over in uh, Europe will also have the same, same in America too. Um, some other manufacturers may use these. Uh, we'll come on to the pros and cons of that very shortly. Uh, secondary force calibration is um, a device that's had a calibration carried out by primary force and then you have a working standard calibration that can be either and that's typically 
the, the kind of uh, products or the services that we provide uh, to, to calibrate uh, in an industrial environment. So going into those kind of calibration uh, devices, dead weight uh, uh, force calibration, uh, uniaxial device, um, benefits are you inherently, they will have uh, a very good, uh, very low uncertainty of measurement and they tend to be off reading, and very high stability and extremely low, low drift. Uh, the benefit of this type is that gravity is free as long as you've got uh, quantified masses. Um, it's a, a, a very stable device. But there are drawbacks. You have limited mass ranges, which means that you have discrete intervals. Um, you can see on the left-hand image, that uh, is a very large calibration device, and by no means it's the largest. Um, that is around about five meters in height. Um, extensive recalibration cycles, where you have to completely dis, uh, disassemble the, the frame and uh, recalibrate each mass individually, and they tend to be quite expensive beasts. So a lot of facilities will have a, an electrical hydraulic actuator, a secondary um, calibration device, again uniaxial, Again, this is our 10 kilonewton frame. The benefits of this is it's a very compact size, it is by interpolation we can have infinite force points a relatively simple recalibration cycles because it's uh, almost modular in uh, construction the instrumentation can come out and be calibrated independently uh, they tend to be significantly lower cost as well the drawbacks of this is because you're relying on a primary calibration source the uncertainties tend to be a bit higher um, that will necessitate that you tend to calibrate more industrial devices rather than um, what national physical, physical laboratory and other national bodies can do. Uh, there are also more frequent calibration cycles because you've got more uh, equipment within it. There are several calibration standards that either types of calibration source can uh, calibrate to. And just a few here. Uh, the kind of gold standards, the, the top two is 376 and the American version E74. The, uh, the calibration frames that we have have uh, load cell primary load cells calibrated to 376. Um, a lot of calibration facilities will use 7500, which is a calibration of the entire frame. Um, our accreditation to UCAS or by UCAS is for 8422, which is force measurement of strength gauge load cells, and then the German version of that DKD 33. And then other companies may offer a calibration, uh, which is their own working standard, their own company specific derived calibration. If we look into 8422 in more detail, there are several calibration cycles uh, described in this. The standard calibration is as seen here. Um, if I just walk through what it is, you have a, a preload to full calibration force, hold for 60 seconds and then drop back to zero, hold for 60 seconds. You repeat that three times. That gives you a, a kind of bedding in, exercising, uh, three times run so everything's ready for the calibration. You then run the first calibration cycle with a minimum of five equidistance, equispaced points. You take up to each point, hold it for 30 seconds, and then take the measurement before proceeding to the next. You then drop down um, in exactly the same measure, coming back down to zero. At this point, you will take the device out, rotate it through uh, 120 degrees, and then conduct a single preload or proof load up to full rated load hold for 60 seconds and then you run your second calibration cycle and then you take the device out, rotate through 120 degrees and then again you do the preload and the full calibration run again. Quite an involved calibration cycle and quite common across uh, lots of different calibrations, force calibrations, even moment calibrations. You will then do a, uh, conduct a, a second order regression to produce your nonlinearity. 
Uh, and because you have actually a change of position, you have a reproducibility value as well. Moving on, there is a supplementary B calibration, which differs from the standard calibration in which you uh, have no rotation. You just conduct three uh, calibration cycles after the three preloads. This again will give you a non-linearity, second order regression. It can offer you a, a repeatability, not a reproducibility, but more importantly, is it offers you a, a hysteresis. And we'll come on to uh, some of those uh, uh, evaluations now. So for non-linearity, I've never seen a device that will give you a perfectly linear response. You can get very close, but it's never perfectly linear. This is a vastly exaggerated um, response where the straight line response is in, denoted by the blue line and the actual response of the device under test is the orange. I, I would be very suspect of a device that performed like this in real life. However, if you carried out a, a linear um, evaluation of zero and full scale, the actual response of this device is 10% error at midpoint, which in actuality is, is a terrible device for, for that kind of performance. However, most uh, calibrations uh, for force measurement offer the uh, second and sometimes even a third order regression. So for a second order regression, the actual error drops down to minus just over 0.1% and a third order is just under minus 0.1%. Quite often, when you're having regressions like this, you will have uh, a regression which is force in terms of response, which is uh, a lot of instrumentation will allow you to put those uh, regression coefficients into, uh, and you actually take out this nonlinearity almost entirely. Reproducibility, which is the, the part of the calibration where you rotate the device through 120 degrees uh, and three independent setups. You carry out uh, a mean of the three runs and then you uh, uh, produce reproducibility uh, as a function from the worst deviation of, from that mean. Ability is very similar. Uh, this time there is no change in position and again a mean is generated and a repeatability uh, worst case from the, the deviation from that mean. Then we come to hysteresis. Um, on hysteresis that's the difference between increasing values and decreasing values and uh, generically you would give the largest deviation between an increasing run and a decreasing run. However, there are, those are just the, the very simple uh, calibrations and, and to be honest, 99% of everything that most calibration labs will produce. However, 8422 and some of the others offer you an awful lot more. Um, in normal day use, you wouldn't normally go for these. This is more for academic research purposes um, and uh, National Physical Laboratory offer a lot more as well other um, international national bodies. So I'll, I'm not going to these if people want to know more we can uh, discuss this at a later stage. One of the main questions we get is why would I go for traceable and why would I go for accredited? There are some subtle differences on a traceable calibration. Um, you effectively need to demonstrate an unbroken chain to national and international standards of all the instrumentation that you're using to generate that calibration. For an accredited calibration, um, that is uh, where it's been accredited, say in the UK, in UCAS for the UK, um, you have to demonstrate a, a full traceable uh, unbroken chain, but you also have to be um, in audited and accredited by UCAS that you are conducting it in accordance with 17025. Um, this goes into further uh, detail than just traceable, where you need to have, demonstrate staff competencies, staff training, audited practices, inter- and intra-laboratory comparisons with other uh, accredited laboratories to understand any deviations. Um, 
And once you've decided do you want a traceable or an accredited? And to be fair, most accredited calibration labs will offer traceable as well, and most likely be on the same equipment. Which one do you select? Uh, it is entirely down to either the quality management system of the company carrying out the use of the calibrated device or the regulations and legislation covering the uh, calibrated equipment at the point of use. So coming on very uh, close to the end now, um, we see quite a lot of specification issues coming through. Um, and to, to give you a few of the more common ones is uh, you have a requirement at the end of use that you have to have a calibration uncertainty of 0.1% where you wouldn't use a calibration facility of 0.4%. Um, you wouldn't use a 100 kilonewton cell for a 10 kilonewton range. A very coarse description of that would be uh, you wouldn't use bathroom scales to um, use in the kitchen for baking ingredients. It would be a pretty horrific cake. Uh, the display resolution is too coarse. So if you've got a, a one kilonewton range with a one decimal resolution, the uncertainty of the device under test is 10%. You're not going to get great resolution. And then finally, static versus dynamic. Um, all the standards that I've mentioned before, including those that we carry out, we, uh, all the measurements are taken at steady state, at static force levels. There is very little to follow when it comes to dynamic measurements. Um, and realistically, you need to take into much more consideration frequency response, both the load cell and the instrument used with regard to the, the dynamic measurement requirements that you're going to conduct. So that's a, a quick run through of um, calibration in a force lab. As I say, it uh, has quite a lot of carryover to other calibration facilities. But um, any questions? Thank you, Miles. It's uh, ahead of schedule, so we have plenty of time for questions. If you want to ask questions, stick your hand up or put the question in the chat window is probably the easiest, and then we can pass them around. I like the analogy about scales and cakes. It's a relevant <laughs> for the time of year. I've seen Absolutely. a picture of scales which it claims to have strain gauges on it, which no doubt goes down well with the audience. <laughs> yes, we get that one a lot. Uh, why would you use something that is disproportionately larger than what you're, you're trying to measure? Any, any questions? I can't see anything in the chat window unless I've missed it, Sarah. Oh, here we go. Just one popped in, Robert. No, I've just got to find the window. Here we go. Paul Williams from Safran Landing Systems. Following BS8422, would you provide a single slope for both compression and tension or single slope covering both? Um, one in each of the directions. Um, we try when we calibrate a tension and compression device to use the same setup for tension and compression. However, we were still, because of the prescription, prescriptive manner of 8422, you have to carry them out as separate calibrations. Thank you. I think we have a follow-up question coming. Okay, thank, thank you for the first bit, same, same Paul Williams. Thank you for the first answer. And what is your lab force capacity? Five meganewtons. We are, our smallest interval is five grams and our largest interval is five meganewtons. You wouldn't want to get those mixed up. <laughs> we have broken a few. I think there's another one coming. 
the next question, are you planning to gain accreditation to ISO 36, sorry, 376? All of our calibration frames are either new, uh, are hydraulic or uh, electro, servo electric, uh, and therefore we cannot get to 376 on the accuracies that we uh, we run. We've had the discussion, but um, dead weight machines, to be fair, our facility isn't even big enough to put dead weight machines in. So, in short, no, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Paul. A any more questions? Okay. So, Raul Rodriguez says, at the beginning of your presentation, did you mention about a particular number of repetitions for a measurement? He thinks he heard five. Um, that was just a... This number. Right. Um, normally, most standards will um, mandate that you do three runs. Um, all I've done is uh, I've lifted off a, a fairly common representation of accuracy and precision. So there were five there. We can go higher, but most standards um, mandate three runs. Thank you. We have another one typing away. Stu Dedman says we do some in-house checks for lab load cells and we find repeatability on rotation is a problem. Do you have any tips for reducing that issue? That's a good question. That is a good question. Um, first of all, alignment. Uh, the platens that we have are um, the non-parallelism is down at 2 microns at 200 millimeters. I'm racking my brain now. Two, two microns at 200 millimeters and they cost a fortune for that. Any more than that and you can start seeing variations due to rotation. Okay. I think there's a follow-up coming. Okay, he says that, thank you for that. We'll never get that alignment, but at least we know what the, <laughs> at least we know what the cause is, which is a good good place to start. Yes, it, it's it's one of those you can do repeatability on your frame for that. And uh, uh, when we've had our frames delivered, they are designed or they are made manufactured to our designs. Um, it can take one to two days to get that run out absolutely quantified uh, and removed. It does. It's a lot of. Um, uh, kind of uh, a lot of um, guess and test to begin with until you find the sweet spot. Okay, and then one from Zoe Checkley. Do you create an MUA with all of the different factors, including temperature effects, for all yes. of your equipment? We do, yes. Even, even down to um, where we calibrate or we have uh, instrumentation calibrated externally, we take into account their uncertainty and the uncertainty of the instrument and wind that in together. Okay, we have another one coming in. How do you decide, another one from Stuart Edmonds, I should have said, how do you decide temperature uncertainty for a strain gauge load cell? We, um, all the um, temperature coefficients of all the instrumentation that we've got to achieve the measurement come with their own specifications from the manufacturers. Um, of what drift it will be across. Normally it's given as a, a, a 10 degree Kelvin range, but because we specify that ours are carried out within one degree, uh, that's what we adopt. Um, if you're talking about the load cell itself, that is somewhat down to the manufacturer of the load cell or the device under test. Thank you. He says thanks. Okay, any more? We have plenty of time if you want to. I would remind you the purpose of the EIS is to help people share ideas and compare notes. So when we go back to live presentations, the, the idea of doing these discussions over coffee, you can have a much more interactive discussion and debate. Absolutely. It's something yes. something yeah. we encourage. 
Let's see, no more going once, going twice, going three times. Okay, I'll hand you back. Miles, thank you very much for the thought provoking one. You've got more questions than uh, we've had recently, so that was a good sign. Thank you for that. Much welcome, much welcome. And I'll hand you back to Sarah. Thank you for joining us, everyone. I'll just go back. I think you can probably see these slides. Um, I'm just going to skip through to the end so you can which webinars are coming up in the next few weeks and of course there are more things next year so it, I think most of you are on our, our mailing list and have registered for other events but if you would like to register for any things that are coming up in the near future then please do drop me an email thank you okay with that I'll say thank you everybody and thank you Miles <laughs>